So one of the unexpected benefits of writing sermons for 20 years is being able to see how my thinking has changed or what I've learned, or in this case, what I have unlearned. Today, we're continuing our series on the seven, soon to be eight principles of Unitarian Universalism, and we are up to number five, which is as follows. We, the member congregations of the Unitarian Universalist Association, covenant to affirm and promote the right of conscience and the use of the democratic process in our congregations and in society at large. So nine years ago, in 2012, I wrote a sermon called The Roots of Democracy, in which I tried to make the point that the American Constitution was rooted in Enlightenment period, humanistic, essentially spiritual values of human potential and human reason. And I pulled up that manuscript manuscript last week and I read it again, and all I could think was, man, good heavens, was I naive or what? Not that naivete uh, is necessarily bad or that it doesn't have some value, but it is so clear to me now how much I really didn't know about the origins Uh, of America or the motivations of the men who wrote our much vaunted constitution. I was ignorant of some of the events that were informing their decisions. I was ignorant of how invested nearly all of them, including Washington, Jefferson, Hamilton, and all those other household names were in preserving human slavery. I was ignorant of just how exclusive as in classist, sexist, and racist was their thinking when they proposed that all men are created equal and how that phrase was really much more like a rhetorical flourish than an ideal that they actually intended to follow, they didn't mean it even one little bit. And perhaps especially I was ignorant of how many, even most, North American indigenous peoples already had highly developed democratic systems for governance in their complex societies that had nothing whatsoever to do with European thinking, humanistic, enlightened, or otherwise. In fact, I didn't know my arse from my elbow when I wrote that sermon. Now, one of the other unexpected benefits of writing sermons for 20 years is that if if you let it, it can keep you kind of humble make me way more careful about making categorical statements, make me wonder about all the other things about which I am still utterly, profoundly ignorant. So I want to fill in just a little of what I've learned since 2012. The American Revolution was not conducted to obtain freedom for the people who lived in North America. The American Constitution was not created to ensure freedom for the people who lived in North America. That was never its intention. The American Revolution and the American Constitution were expressly created to allow wealthy, white, slave-owning men to continue to acquire North American land and wealth, including human slaves, uninhibited by European interference. Period. Unlike Other revolutions, which more typically arise from common people or from the poor getting fed up with oppression, the American Revolution was a rich man's revolt. There was no intention of including women or people of color or indigenous people or poor people or uneducated people or really anyone except wealthy, white, land and or slave owning men in the benefits of being independent from England and from Europe. And Frankly, everything else we've been told about that was and is propaganda. If you'd like to read up on some modern historical scholarship on this, it is readily available. The other thing I mentioned that I was ignorant of was, when it comes to democracy, was how the indigenous people on this continent were already using it both direct democracy and a more federal approach or federalistic approach, depending on the region and on the issue. 
The Cherokee people in North Carolina, just as one example, used a council of seven elders, all women, elected from each of the seven clans. And anyone in any clan at any time could raise the issue of replacing their representative. The council of elders, when they got together, would appoint people, even men, to do things like gather information or conduct a war or settle disputes or distribute resources. There are stories about how it would drive the Europeans nuts that these deliberations from these uh, native indigenous councils would go on for weeks sometimes, even months, as they considered all the opinions and weighed all the implications of all of the options. There was a tradition of consensus in these councils and an understanding that consensus takes a lot of time. There are other stories about how the Cherokee and many other indigenous peoples too would sometimes wait for the Europeans to bring their women to the table so real business could be done. They couldn't understand how white men could make decisions all on their own. The Europeans for their part couldn't understand why everyone needed to be consulted by the councils and all the stories and all the opinions needed to be heard. They couldn't understand why Every clan and village kept a common storehouse of food and tools and clothing and supplies that every person and family would contribute to and that the local council would then distribute if someone were sick or injured or poor or if there were unexpected visitors or a cause for a celebration. The Europeans were also confused by the right of conscience that was assumed among the Cherokee and many other indigenous peoples. For instance, there was no shame in a warrior refusing to go fight if he felt that a cause was unjust or had other priorities to attend to. These are huge differences in how different cultures approached the idea of democracy. Barbara Duncan is a scholar of Cherokee history and a noted folklorist. She once said, our culture, meaning American culture, our culture is based on acquiring things, acquiring more things than other people and getting to the top of the hierarchy, which is how we see everything. And we can see this in our traditional stories, right? If we look at our folk tales, which are not some ancient thing from Brothers Grimm, but also still very much alive today in Disney movies. For the stories with Jack, right? Jack is the main character who goes out to seek his fortune Happy ending for Jack is that he marries the princess and has a pot of gold. So, you know, it's this elevating your social status and getting money. There is not a single Cherokee story or American indigenous story that ends like that. That is not a happy ending in indigenous American stories. The happy ending in American indigenous stories is that somebody learns a lesson that helps them get along with other people. One of the things I became aware of as I was reading about this and comparing American democracy to indigenous democracy is that indigenous democracy is democracy without capitalism. And isn't that interesting? The goal of indigenous governance and even of life itself, culturally internalized, was to maintain balance and mirroring nature of necessity then had to be radically inclusive and respectful of individual freedom. Contrast this with democracy as created by Europeans, for whom the goal of governance and even life itself is to get ahead even at the expense of other people or the natural world or most any other possible priority. Where we demonstrably know the price of everything and the value of nothing, where we make it costly, both economically and socially, to practice the right of conscience, especially if your conscience discerns, for instance, capitalism to be unhealthy to children and other living things. There's a story about Chief Drowning Bear of the Ketua clan who read the book of Matthew from the New Testament and asked what he thought about it. He said, it's wonderful. Too bad the white man is no better off for having had it so long.
So let's look a little closer at just what a democracy is, because we should be clear about that. There are many definitions, but they fall into essentially two categories. One type defines democracy by the means and the methods of democracy, that is, the processes and the requirements and the logistics. These typically include four points, free and fair elections, free and accessible ways to participate in decision-making, protection of civil rights, and a rule of law that gets applied to everyone equally. The other type of definition of democracy tends to describe the ends, that is the outcome, the goals, the freedoms and the benefits, the hoped for outcomes of democracy. My favorite of this type was said by President Franklin Roosevelt in 1941. He said the four freedoms of democracy that should inform all policymaking were freedom of speech, freedom of worship, freedom from want, and freedom from fear. And I'm especially taken with those four freedoms because in my mind, they beautifully describe the right of conscience that is called out in our fifth principle. The right of conscience was and is a cornerstone of Unitarian Universalist faith. And I'll say those four freedoms again, freedom of speech, freedom of worship, freedom from want, and freedom from fear. We at First Unitarian Denver and Unitarian Universalism, we believe in the healing power of honest relationships, of seeing and being seen, of hearing and being heard, of inclusion over exclusion to the fullest extent possible without infringing on the rights of others, making the circle of our compassion, concern, and community ever wider and ever more loving. For us, the fifth principle, the right of conscience and the democratic process is both a means and an end. Because we're human. We know we're going to make mistakes. We know our knowledge is never complete. We know that whoever we are, there's always, always room to grow. Upholding the right of conscience and the use of the democratic process optimizes the odds that people will be seen and heard. Optimizes the odds that we can be free from want and fear. Optimizes the odds that we might get it right when it comes to living peacefully, powerfully, lovingly in a diverse human community. So central to the spiritual life of First Unitarian Denver are these ideas that we wrote them pretty much directly into our congregational covenant. And I'm going to close with those words. I will listen to you. I will make space for you. I will include you. Together, we will be a community of love, respect, and justice. Together, we will learn about white supremacy culture to create an equitable congregation. Together, we will protect the vulnerable. When we fall out of covenant, we will call each other back in. Amen. <laughs>